thank you all very much for coming to today's um, webinar tagged um, FinTech, Blockchain, and Smart Contracts. And it is an honor to be asked to moderate today's webinar. And I'm very pleased to introduce to you our speakers um, for today's topic. Um, first, we have um, Lady Victoria Walker, who is a consultant at um, Blockchain Solutions Architects. We also have um, Mr. Aditayo Adebajo, who is the managing director at Jelurida Africa. We have the third speaker as um, Mr. Chia Gose um, Iwu, who is a chief executive officer at Niger Crypto. We have uh, Mr. Max Ikongbe, who is the principal Evalo Associates. And we also have um, Mr. Senator in Henyen, who is the lead partner in Fusion Lawyers. Now, before I go on to ask our speakers to do their presentations, I will speak a bit about myself and the company I work for. ESQ Trainings Limited is, uh, is focused primarily on providing knowledge sharing sessions, such as this webinar, and um, public and implant trainings for companies, law firms, tech premiums, and businesses. Our mission is to expand the frontiers of continuous professional learning with trainings and courses across various practices. Um, we have tagged this webinar series, the Launch Hour webinar series, as they are stated to hold at 1 p.m. during our lunch break. They will hold two times every week, Tuesdays and Thursdays, respectively. And at every session, we will provide the resources in easily accessible formats on the go for everyone who is interested. Um, please ensure to use the Q&A tab to ask your questions and our panel will attend to them at the end of their presentations. Today's webinar is on FinTech, blockchain, and smart contracts. And blockchain is arguably the most significant innovation on the internet right now, and has had significant impact on a variety of industries, including finance, legal, and even the regulatory landscape. So our experts will um, cover topics um, around um, the fundamentals of FinTech, blockchain and smart contracts, visualizing the regulatory landscape of the fintech industry, solving the world's greatest challenges through blockchain technology, the, the trust protocol, um, blockchain, DAO, and smart contracts, crypto regulation, adoption, and challenges. Um, without further ado, I would go on to call our first speaker, um, who would be uh, Lady Victoria Walker. Um, you have the floor, Matt. Thank you very much. Hello, Matt. Can you hear me? Oh, sorry about that. Thank you so much for You're your welcome. introduction. And um, welcome, everybody. So my name is Lady Victoria Walker. And today I'm going to be talking about uh, how blockchain technology can solve some of the world's greatest challenges. Uh, so I will go ahead and go into the presentation. If you just give me one second for me to get my, my screen up and present it. But thank you, everybody. Uh, it's really great to be able to, again, share, share this knowledge and the opportunity that presents itself to, to all of us when it comes to blockchain technology. So can I just confirm everybody can see my screen? Can you just confirm you can see my screen? Uh, just so I know that we are sharing and... Um, yes, we can, but we have a blank um, screen. Just a white um, paper deck. Say that again. Um, we just have a blank screen, which is a white screen. Okay. Um, let me try this one again. Bear with me one second. Um, how about now? Can Fantastic. You guys... Yes. Okay. Yes, Brilliant. So, welcome, guys. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about solving the world's greatest challenges through blockchain technology. And I think right now we're, we're really in a very interesting time on the global stage of the world. And technology, I have this big belief, um, which is we have all the solutions to fix many of 
the problems we face in the world, such as poverty, uh, climate change, uh, inequality, infrastructure building, finance, all these things that we need to, to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, we have an opportunity to use technology to afford us the opportunity to, to create changes. So I'm gonna be talking um, a little bit about this and sharing some, some use cases. So anytime I start a presentation, one of the things that I, I tend to do is to really bring people back to where we came from in technology and kind of where we're going. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit firstly about the fourth wave of technology because we are being ushered in into this new era, which is blockchain technology and other technologies that have been created off the back of the third wave technology um, era. And so I'm gonna really start this presentation talking about this. Then we're gonna talk about what is blockchain technology. Now I'm sure some of you may know, some of you may not know. And I think a lot of us in the space take it for granted that there's a lot of people that may not uh, really understand how blockchain works in the, in the sense of the technology, the, the ideology of consensus um, and storing data and information in a chain of blocks. So I'm going to give a really cool analogy. Um, one of the things that I'm known for is I make complex uh, ideas simple to understand, um, because if you're not from a technical background, uh, sometimes the jargon, sometimes being too technical can confuse people. And the goal is, is to make this technology very, very easy to understand uh, and, and enable business owners, um, governments and different stakeholders who are not from a technical background to understand how it can work for them on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and then I'm gonna just share a few use cases around business transactions, supply chain and governance, and how this technology can solve some of the major problems in these areas. Okay, so moving on. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm Victoria Walker, Lady Victoria Walker, and I'm a blockchain solutions architect consultant and the co-founder of Cax Intelligence. And Cax Intelligence is a blockchain development company that supports governments, enterprises, and entrepreneurs to leverage blockchain technology in their organizations. So we you know a lot of people did adopt some of the newer technology um, like database warehouses and cloud technology. And now we really specialize in implementing blockchain solutions for business owners that feel this technology can add value to their, their projects or companies. Okay, so how can blockchain or how blockchain could change our world? So I wanna talk about the industrial revolution. I start off here because this is kind of like the very beginning stages of where we started with technology and we are in a going through the fourth, um, fourth industrial revolution at this point in time in history. So going back, um, the industrial revolution, as some of you may know, was a period of major industrialization and innovation in the late 1700s and 1800s. Um, it, it, it really began after um, the, the First World War and it was really about building and using new technology. Um, so the American Industrial Revolution, commonly referred to the Second Industrial Revolution, started some time after. So I'm just going to walk you through like the fourth, fourth waves of technology, and, and that kind of brings us to today. So the first wave, which was the first Industrial Revolution, was when the first technology, which was about steam trains, and we started to look at manufacturing um, mechanisms, and this was kind of like the first time we started to see um, scientific and technology really start to change our world. We saw um, the ability to move goods um, from vast, vast, vast spaces because we had this new technology. Then we had the second wave of technology, um, which was the second industrial revolution. And this is where we started to see the industrialization of mass big factories that were creating cars and TVs and things like this. And this was a period between 1870s to the 1930s. So 
these were the, like the early eras. Then we went to the third revolution, which is where we are from the 1970s to today. So this was where we saw, um, we saw credit cards being introduced, the internet, mass communications, uh, all these platforms that we have. So social media is even part of this, this particular um, period of time. So this is kind of run from the late 1970s um, right down to today where we have this um, technology, this mass uh, ability to communicate, um, to share content, to, to connect with people all over the world. And now we're at the beginning stages of moving into the fourth industrial revolution with technology, which is things like digital technologies, the internet of things, blockchain technology, um, augmented reality, and virtual reality. So we've seen these new um, technologies grow over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, we have the internet of things, which is why we're connecting objects to uh, information and data on the, in the real world to the technological world. Um, we see things like virtual reality and augmented reality where we're having to, again, interface technology more into the real world. Um, big data, artificial intelligence, cloud computing, these are all fourth wave industrial technologies that are set to change the world. And what we're going to be talking about today is blockchain, which I believe is the number one technology that underpins a lot of these other fourth wave technologies. And as I said, my, my belief and why I'm so passionate about blockchain technology and many of the uh, applications is because it can solve some of the major problems in our world. So you're at the cusp of a new wave, a fourth industrial um, revolution. And when you understand the possibilities, you can maximize the opportunities. And that is the core of why I'm here today is to share with you all the potential opportunities, the problems and the solutions we can implement with blockchain technology. Okay, so what is block blockchain technology? Uh, so for, for those of you who don't know, I, again, as I said, I, I use a very strong analogy because I think you have to really understand the basis of technology, of what it does and why it's different. So I have a little an analogy called the Morland's Village. It's a story that kind of conceptualizes how and what blockchain does. So once upon a time, there was a small farming village called the Morlands, and the Morlands was a very small community. It had about 64 citizens with 15 families. And these families would farm, they would hunt, and they would produce their own goods. And at this time, there was no sort of money. So they used to trade these items between the families. And it was a a good way of doing it because it was easy for people to to manage uh you know trade so maybe one farmer had oranges and another person had grapes so they would trade these items and the families trusted each other and worked as a collaborative community so as i said on some occasions one family might not have enough items to trade and so what they would do is they would trust or loan the goods until the other person or family could repay. But then it became a problem. There were too many promises to pay and there was just too many IOUs. There was no order or no system in place to keep record of these transactions and the IOUs. So this caused a lot of confusion. And you know the villagers started to lose track of what was actually um, owed out. So then they came up with a solution, and this was to hire a ledger man. This was somebody who would basically be assigned to keep track of the items in a ledger. So it was like a scorekeeper. He worked out um, what was owed, uh, what was meant to be paid out, and it worked because there was now like a record keeping ledger that everybody trusted and believed that, okay, this information on this ledger is true and you know we can trust it. 
But then the ledger man started to add in charges for his record keeping services. Um, and then further down the line, he started to accept bribes to wipe off the debts. And so the records lost the integrity and it was no longer fair or honest. So after like a lot of confusion and chaos and fighting in the village, the villagers actually found out that the ledger man was being corrupt and, and, and not being honest. And so they knew that having a ledger made sense, but they wanted to come up with a solution. So instead what they did, instead of one person having a ledger, everybody in the community had a copy of the ledger. And so what they would do is the villagers from all, all the families would gather to around the village square throughout the day. And at these gatherings, they would trade goods and everyone would keep track of every promise made in the ledger. Then once a week, each villager would reach out to, another, to each other's records and then read each other's ledgers um, to check for any discrepancies. So maybe somebody had um, a, a, a record that was wrong. And if there was any discrepancies, they would check all the ledgers and then they would choose the most commonly entered record as the correct one. So for example, if let's say 12 people had a ledger and maybe three people's ledger was incorrect or those discrepancies, the other nine records that were correct, they would, they would agree that that was the correct record. And it was basically based on this consensus that because we all have this record, or this, this ledger, the, the one with the most accurate and the most people that have the most accurate record, we would agree that that was the, the point of truth and that is how we would maintain the record. And this is basically how blockchain technology works. It's exactly like a community red ledger. It's a distributed ledger with information owned by the community. So like Bitcoin, um, all owners own this ledger and every transaction on the blockchain is recorded. So there's not one source of truth, there's hundreds. And so it's very difficult to go back and alter any information on the transactions um, because you'd have to get consensus and agreement from every single body that has a copy of that ledger. So this is what makes blockchain technology very, very useful for the aspect of keeping data and information integral, um, having a source of transparency, and then having a community consensus of a point of truth so that we all agree rather than having one centralized um, person like the ledger man to keep this information fair, honest, and intact. And this is where we're seeing a big change in how we store and share information. So how can this technology, this ability to be able to have this one source of truth be able to change and, and solve some of the world's biggest challenges? And this is where I talk about um, three use cases that I think can be quite helpful for you, for you all to understand how we can apply this technology to create a more fairer, transparent, and community-based world. Because really right now, how things work is we, we, we always have to rely on a third party. We have to rely on either a banking institution or an intermediary, and we have to trust that they're going to make the right decisions on our behalf with our assets, uh, with your wealth, um, with your documentation. And in this growing, growing, ever big world of data and information, and again, people that maybe aren't trustworthy, we have to put a lot of faith into these systems, which we've seen um, over many years hasn't really worked. Um, going back to sort of like in 2008, where we had the major banking crisis or the global banking crisis, where you know millions of people lost money because they put faith in bankers and the banks. And unfortunately, it kind of created this new sentiment that we needed a new way because the old way isn't working for the for the for the betterment of of the all. So the first use case I'm going to talk about is the problems with transactions, because this is where blockchain applications, with Bitcoin being the, one of the first um, blockchain applications, uh, became 
quite um, noteworthy and newsworthy and really kind of brought this technology to the world stage. Now, currently, most of the payments in nearly every industry have to be made by a third party financial institution. And we have to trust that these third party institutions act in good faith and protect us and protect our wealth, money and assets. But in certain instances, we can fall victim to technical errors, hacking, fraud, and loss because of this trust. And I know, particularly in Nigeria, um, we see, a, I've seen it a lot in some of the blogs um, where we've seen accounts that have been manipulated. Um, people have woken up to see that the money's been removed from their account. And you know, we've seen even people commit suicide because of these things. And this is often to do with how the existing databases and, and existing structures of technology work. Because a lot of the, the data in a technology system right now, when we're looking at third wave technology that isn't on the blockchain, is very simple to replicate and to alter and change without any sort of consensus or without anybody even noticing until it's too late. So this is a big, big problem. I believe that uh, a lot of people have faced or, or may face. And it's, it's one of those situations where um, because you don't have that control and because in some instances there isn't that ability to actually stop some of these things because a lot of the systems are hackable you can alter the data whereas with a blockchain solution because there is more than one central point of records in order to be able to change or hack or remove or do a transaction there has to be consensus of the group that this transaction can happen so we are seeing that with with blockchain, it's, it's, it's possible to avoid middlemen in many cases. Um, what you can send, well, one person can send their digital payments from their virtual wallets to a recipient's wallet um, with just the help of digital keys. It becomes very, very simple and um, very safe and quick to send secure and irreversible transactions which makes them more advanced and better than bank transfers. You know, banking, the banking system has not seen any innovation uh, for years. And, you know, right now, when it comes to transactions, people are paying high fees. Um, there's a lot of things wrong with how um, the money that belongs to us uh, is, is, is trans transacted. So, one of the solutions blockchain can offer is the secure peer-to-peer -peer ability to send payments or, and it doesn't have to just be payments. It can be any form of transactions. It can be contracts. Um, it can be anything that you need to send over the internet. A blockchain can provide that ability to have that integrity and truth. And also that it's not just held by one person. We can ensure that our data and information is held via consensus on a group of people. Uh, another big problem um, that we're seeing, and I believe this situation is probably going to um, become worse, especially now that at this time of recording this, we are seeing major disruptions in our supply chains in the um, gas and energy sector, um, which will then trickle down into food um, and of and electronics and things like that. So when we comes to supply chains and logistics, um, it's extremely complex, very, very complex. You know, some products undergo dozens or even hundreds of steps in the supply chain journey just to reach your doorstep. Um, and some of these supply um, supply chains uh, for some products can, can take years, months or years. And again, we have the same problem where somewhere along the line, if there is error, if there's fraud, um, and if there's um, different circumstances, it can lead to high losses. And we're seeing this again now in, in Nigeria, particularly with the fuel crisis, because what we have to understand with this situation is that 
if there had been a, a more transparent way of being able to, you know, verify and check the source um, of, of um, the source of truth, to, to be able to update the data that, okay, what we're bringing in. I mean, I believe it was 100 million um, liters of fuel that was um, contaminated, which is kind of the, you know, the backbone of why this fuel scarcity is happening. But if we had a, a better way of managing these complex supply chains, would that have been caught earlier? Could there have been contingencies to even pre-plan what needs or what could happen or what scenarios could happen if we had a, a, a shorter, less complex uh, supply chain system and supply chain processes? So the blockchain is a very, very um, you know, promising technology for supply chain management because it's it's easier to improve asset recording, tracking, assigning, linking, and sharing in a huge way because we're dealing with multiple different countries. Um, you know, we're dealing with different individuals who have to approve and sign. But if we had a technology that was able to keep these records and have this truth point of truth, that's again agreed by consensus rather than it being one or two or three people who again might have their own agenda or their own interests being um, fueled by their, their, their information or their improvements, then we might see that these sorts of problems will become less and less and less. So blockchain can facilitate the efficiency. And this is what we want is efficiency of supply chain significantly because it offers excellent security and transparency of transactions. And this is a key thing. When we have transparency, when we have a level of security around how we transact and around how we keep records and around how we track and assign, then we have a solution to the current problems that a lot of supply chains face. Anybody that's in the supply chain industry will know the problems of getting things authorized, checked, knowing where they come from and things like that. So blockchain can help document the supply chain journey of every product for better transparent and um, better protection and transparency of every step. Okay, moving on to the final um, problem that we uh, again can, can see with blockchain and this new wave of technology is governance. So currently the standard of identity management and managing citizens and voting are very different across the world, um, but we could potentially stand, standardize this with again, um, a blockchain solution and other technologies like biometrics. Um, the current way we do voting, especially now we still do paper voting and voting polls, it makes the, the voting process very long. Um, it makes it quite inconvenient and again, vulnerable to rigging. Um, so when we have these again, um, loose areas, we also have this challenge of being able to again, how do we verify the data? How do we know it's real? How do we know it's true? Um, and this is one of the biggest challenges that not just like countries like Nigeria, but all around the world experience when it comes to governance and managing people, you know? Um, so um, one of the things we can do um, with blockchain solution is blockchain can make voting systems a lot more efficient um, by automatically checking voting records for fraud. Um, again, a combination of biometric technology and blockchain can replace the outdated voting system of paper ballots and having to queue up and registration. And it will make participating in elections, receiving any government benefits and traveling a lot easier for us. So these are like the, the three main areas where I personally believe blockchain technology has the scope and potential to really, really change uh, how we do things. And just in, in some closing remarks, um, I, I really am a big believer in this, this quote by um, Benjamin, uh, sorry, book, book Minister Fuller. And he was a gentleman that believed, again, kind of like what I believe that technology can really change the world. And he's mentioned a, a concept about the final examination and whether or not 
we as human beings and we as uh, global communities can actually uh, create a world that's more fairer. Um, and he says, humanity is taking its final examination. We have to come to an extraordinary moment when it doesn't have to be you or me. There's enough for all. We need not to operate competitively any longer. If we succeed, it will be because of our youth, truth, and love. So that is the end of my brief presentation. Thank you, everybody. Um, feel free to reach out, connect with me on LinkedIn, um, Instagram, and Twitter. And if you do have any questions, please feel free to ask, um, and I can answer for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Lady Victoria. That was an awesome presentation. And uh, more importantly was the fact that you were able to use um, relatable cases in explaining the principle of blockchain, which is quite a, a complex subject matter. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, over to um, Mr. Chia Gose Iwu, who will be doing this um, presentation. Um, Mr. Chia Gose, you have the floor. All right, thank you for having me here. Um, let me share my screen. Give me a second. Okay, just to confirm that um, you can see my screen, right? Yes, we can, clearly. All right, all right. Okay, thanks so much for having me. My name is Chagazi, I'm the founder CEO of Niger Crypto. Um, we're basically a digital assets exchange. And uh, we basically, the aim is to revolutionize the African financial ecosystem utilizing the blockchain, right? So uh, I'm going to be talking to about the fundamentals of blockchain, fintech, and smart contracts, right? And I'm also going to do a bit of a historical dive, right, into how digital assets came about and the origin and some of what formed what we have today as digital assets, right? So, so basically, um, my core panelists has actually said a lot about uh, blockchain, so and and about fintech a bit. So I'm not going to dive so deep into this, but let me talk a bit about fintech, right? So basically, um, back in the mid 2000s not just the mid 2000s from the 80s to the 90s, right? I don't know whether some of us have watched this movie it's where. Um, sort of like on a trading floor, everybody's on a phone, <laughs> like sort of like a brokerage trend. Everybody's with a telephone, right? Trying to get price quotes from different areas and it's noisy and it's chaos and everybody's it's almost like everybody's going mad, right? So this was what financial services was like many years ago, right? Before uh, before fintech came in, right? And most financial technology actually evolved from solving some of all those back office problems, right? So it was, it, there was usually no focus on end user, like on how the consumer is going to be applying this technology and using this technology. It was more or less solving like banking processes, like, oh, how do I get um, a customer information and get this? How do I push trades? Um, how do I push trade information from this broker to the clearing house uh, down to the stock exchange and things like that? So this were some of the things. And, Funny enough, some of the biggest players in the fintech and even the blockchain industry evolved from this society. Case in point, someone like uh, Chen Ping Zhao, the, uh, the CEO of Binance, right? He works with Bloomberg in some of these um, back office applications and things like that. So basically, this is how fintech evolved to this, has evolved to end user. And wherever technology is being applied to streamline financial services, to optimize and make financial services more effective and better, we call it financial technology, fintech, right? So, of course, one of the most popular forms of this these days is blockchain, but uh, uh, fintech has been an evolving industry from um, apps that help you uh, make trades easily to apps that help you send money easily. Even your banking app is a form of financial technology. Down to a lot of things we see today, like the big fintechs in Nigeria, the Pigavets, the Carrywise, the Coda Banks, the um, a lot of them, right? These basically an industry that raised eight hundred million dollars just last year, right? 
mainly because of flux of wave based stock and a couple of other companies. And uh, the global fintech industry is about $110 billion, right, in size. That gives you an insight. And these are all conservative estimates. This gives you an insight into how huge um, this industry is, right? So um, Victoria said a lot, I uh, gave an amazing analogy, right, to understand blockchain. So I'm not going to dive so much into this, right? But um, I'm just going to brush it up a bit. So basically, right, blockchain is a form of DLT, right? And a, a DLT, like she said, right, is a situation whereby you have records that more than one person holds, right? So it's not just one person. It's not just one central party holding these records. More than one person, like lots of people, in the case of the modern day blockchains, tens of thousands of people have access to this information, right? Through what we call nodes, no? And this information, once there's an alteration on this information, is the same alteration across the board. Once there is validation of this information, there's the same validation across the board, right? So what, e, what is in the A, is in the B, is in the C, is in the D, like everybody holds the same form of information, right? And DLTs, Believe me, DLTs have been a popular concept, uh, at least with blockchain. I've seen papers on DLTs as far, as far back as the uh, 1980s, right? Yeah, 1970s, 1980s. And funny enough, the US government was doing something with DLTs um, in the 1980s. But um, we have blockchain, like sort of like revolutionized this. It, it brought in cryptography and the fact that information is transferred, like a, each block holds a certain amount of information and links to another block, hence the name blockchain, basically. So um, it's where blockchain really, really got it. Rest Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever he is, God bless his soul. <laughs> if, he's, if he's dead, kudos to him if he's alive. Whoever he is, is where he got it perfectly. And with the cost of this, you're going to see that um, it, he wasn't um, he wasn't the first person to come up with an idea, but he was one of the first people to make it actually work, right? And yes, as blockchains, one, one of the characteristics that blockchains and all DLTs, by the way, have, but blockchain, the cryptographic element of blockchain makes it even better, is that it is immutable. What do I mean? So if a, use, if a transaction is recorded on a blockchain today, the time is 138, 10 March 2022. In the next 70 years, Nothing changes about that transaction, right? So, uh, um, in, in the political scene, we say people rather say history is written by victors of war, right? And everybody can manipulate things to their own taste. In the case of the blockchain, right, this is unmanipulatable. This data cannot be changed; it cannot be altered, right? And <laughs> basically, it's impossible, right? It's imp <laughs> Let me not go into the technicality of that. So, smart contracts. This is where things get interesting, right? So smart contracts is, um, I personally think that smart contracts is one of the greatest inventions of the 2010s, right? It's not the greatest invention of the 2010s, right? So basically when you have a series of programs, right? That executes automatically based on some preset conditions. So normally if I get into a contract with somebody, there are times, if I do this, do this, do this, we do this. If we, if I do this, do this, and we need physical enforcement to enforce that, yes. Like, for example, if I enter a contract that well, I, want to buy, um, or I want to buy this piece of land, right? And um, at so, so date, at so, so price. If I do not, uh, if the person that entered that contract to sell me that piece of land at that price, at so, so date, does not do that, right? I need to go, I need to sue them to court, and I need the judge to, um, to sort of like, declare that yes this land belongs to me and things like that but in the case of smart contracts right it's auto executed if i enter into this agreement right automatically ownership rights are transferred to you automatically right so it's using a variety of things in fact um smart contracts have been theorized by the table like many years ago but the ethereum which was founded by uh, uh, an individual called vital libertarian and a couple of other folks right so they made this thing more popular, right? Because they actually now synchronize smart contracts with the blockchain and made it in such a way that smart contracts are written on the blockchain. And this is what makes a smart contract immutable and binding, right? So if, if we, uh, let, let, let's assume 
um, using the same example of an asset transfer situation, right? The terms of that contract that the ownership of this house is going to be transferred to is on the blockchain, it's there on the public ledger for everyone to see. So there could not be disputes. I remember what I said about blockchain. Everybody has the same record. So it's basically immutable, right? And um, if one person alters the record, 10,000 other people have this record. So you have to alter it. If you want an alteration to be done, it has to, there has to be a consensus that yes, this alteration has to be done. Now when you hear um, some forks of blockchain, like for example, now there, there were forks of the Bitcoin blockchain, like Bitcoin Cash and a couple of others, because there was a consensus that, okay, we want to alter this information. It could be changing the block size from eight megabytes into megabytes and a couple of other nuances. So um, some of the best use cases of smart contracts are DeFi, NFTs, real estate DAOs, and of course in the legal industry, right? So decentralized finance, right, is a term that has been uh, that has been a buzzword for um, uh, some time now, as well as NFTs, right? So basically, what this is doing is uh, is removing third parties in finance, right? It's removing those central parties that mediate financial transactions and automating everything, right? And NFTs also came out kind of came out of this by making ownership. So, of course, when people hear NFTs, it's talking about arts, music, and it's not just about that. What an NFT does is just shows ownership, right? It just shows ownership. I own this, right? So it's cut across a lot of industries. It could be real estate. It could be commodities. It could be a, a couple of other things, right? It could even be um, a machinery to show that, yes, I own this machinery. That's what an NFT does. So it's kind of a smart contract that shows I own this, and if I want to transfer ownership of that particular contract, right, only I can sign that with my private key, right, and stuff like that. So it's being used. We also have the DAO, the um, decentralized autonomous organizations, which we all believe is going to be the organizations of the future, right, because um, it, it enables sort of like a decentralized participation in an organization. So you don't need a CEO, you don't need a, you know, in fact, you're automating the CEO in this aspect. You don't need a head of human resources and things like that. Every aspect of the organization is decentralized and everybody has their decision-making mechanism in validating what goes on. So I think one of the most popular, there was a called the, uh, the, called the DAO or Build in the Last, right? It was supposed to be a venture capital firm. And, it, and the decision on who is going to be invested in was decentralized according to stakeholders of that particular decentralized autonomous organization, right? And when it comes to smart contracts, right, one of the things I believe that's going to send this to the next wave is artificial intelligence. Yes, it's already been done, but like a lot is still coming, right? Because with artificial intelligence, you can now understand nuances. Human beings, we are emotional beings. We are very emotional, right? So even if I take, um, even if I take a case court and uh, <laughs> the judge is a human being, right? In countries where the jury systems are used, the jury is a human beings. They have some emotional sentiments. The judge has some emotional sentiments. The judge can be right. A lot of things can happen, right? But computers are not so. Once you give a computer a set of instructions, it follows it, right? Then the, when you tell the computer to improve on a set of instructions, right, and create an optimal scenario, that's where artificial intelligence comes in. So if there are nuances in smart contract, artificial intelligence can help solve that by actually optimizing that particular scenario and creating a new set of terms and protocols whereby a scenario can be can uh, can be followed and things like that. So. We'll, we see a world of the future whereby deal making is going to be the easiest thing ever. Deals that take four years to negotiate is going to take basically less than 10 seconds to do once artificial intelligence is involved, right? So let me take um, a more broader dive into the history of, of digital currency, assets to currencies. There is this debate whether they are actually assets of currency. So, whichever side of the divide you are, you're being satisfied here. So, okay, so basically, um, digital currencies are currencies only available in electronic form, true, right? Um, but I want to, I want to like sort of like create, um, um, I want to separate it from money transfer mechanisms, right? So, digital currencies are only present in electronic form. When I transfer money from, let's say, my Access Bank account to your Zenit Bank account, right? No, there is no electronic presence. Um, um, there is a physical presence. Like, there is actually physical cash. It has a physical form. It has, 
um, in non-immutable form, right? So digital currencies completely exist in digital form. Of course, it could be changed to, to um, traditional currencies, but it, in itself, it's a, so that's why like some things like PayPal might not exactly be characterized as a digital currency, but a money transfer mechanism, right? So yes, um, all cryptocurrencies are digital currencies, but all digital currencies are cryptocurrencies. Yeah, this is true. Because when we say digital assets, a lot of people believe that it's just cryptocurrencies. We've had digital assets exist, like you can see when we take a bigger, a bigger dive into the history before uh, cryptocurrency, before Bitcoin, before the um, Bitcoin white paper was written and the first ever cryptocurrency was created. We've seen um, a lot of digital currencies exist, and we're going to take a look at some of them and how many of all those things actually led to the bit uh, to Bitcoin, right? So um, I think in the I think this is seventies or early eighties. There was an invention called digital cash by David Chaum. The original this was the first attempt, right, of a digital currency, or at least the first recorded attempt of a digital currency, right? So, but this didn't have any actual commercial success, right? So um, it was basically supposed to be like a standalone software that interacts with banks. Right, and I even think that some people use the core software then to create some sort of open source software today for that banks can utilize. But um, of course, there are more advanced things than that, right? So I think that was the first attempt at um, a digital currency, but it, it wasn't so known, it wasn't so popular, right? The one that became popular and known was uh, a currency called Ego, founded by Douglas Jackson in 1996 and became wildly used. Um, in the 2000s, right? So what was e-gold? E-gold was supposed to be like a digital currency, as I said, backed by gold, right? So if I issue two ounces of gold, and let's say two ounces of gold is equal to $2,000, right? I can issue $2,000 worth of e Of course, I'm going to come into that. That's not exactly how it works right? no, at, at, at later. But I could e issue $2,000 worth of e-gold, and I could even deal in fractional versions like sort of mini transactions cents right or what we call kobo in nigeria i can deal in mini transactions with the ego right so it, it actually had commercial success it had a lot of users that use this particular digital currency it was uh, it, it was the first digital currency that actually took off and that's one of the reasons it got the attention of the u.s government right so at a point the supply of um the supply of ego Right. Remember, we're supposed to say what e gold is backed by gold. Like if there are two thousand dollars worth of e gold, there is two thousand dollars worth of physical gold being stored somewhere. Right. But at the point you had um, um, twenty eight less twenty eight times the amount of gold actual physical gold. There was a trust mechanism for the gold storage. Right. So you had twenty eight time, times more of the gold that is being stored being actually circulated as e gold. Right. Traditional velocity of money, the US dollar is like six, uh, is like six times. In fact, in Nigeria, I think the velocity of money is like 1.2, around that range, 1.2, 1.6, around that range, which is not such a good thing if you do from a monetary policy perspective, right? So e-gold actually revolutionized a lot of ways people see digital currencies. In fact, one of the things most, uh, one of the licenses a lot of people uh, uh, try to get these days when running a digital asset exchange or some or anything involving digital assets is a money um, is a money transmitter license, right? And before the advent of ego, a money transmitter license was just issued to people for uh, that are just transmitting cash, actual cash, right? Uh, clearing checks and all that. So, but after ego, the um, the U.S. government had to evolve that definition of a money transmitter to involve anything of value being transferred, right? Because why did they do this? It was ego, there was a lot of fraud accusations of ego that people were using this for fraud. While of course the ego team itself was not found liable, but it was said a lot of people were using it for fraud, a lot of people were using it for scams, and ego itself was, was subject to a lot of attacks, right? A, a lot of attacks that's, but for the end of these attacks that also happened to traditional banking, but it's changed a lot of nuances and laws that are still being implemented uh, till today. So there are other uh, pre-Bitcoin digital currencies, hash, cash, web money. Some of them are still existing today. Web money, perfect money still existing. Um, Bitgold, 
um, I've mentioned like Sam when I talked about the um, original proponent of a smart contract, right? Um, these are very important figures when it comes to the evolution of digital currencies. And this is why a lot of people believe he's actually Satoshi Nakamoto, right? So um, before I go into if I go into what um, if I go into Nick Sabo and Bitbo, first of all, right, let me talk about Liberty Reserve. Liberty Reserve, right, was very popular in the uh, early 20s, uh, in the sort of the late 2000s, the late 2000s, before it was closed down. What closed it down, just like Ego, it was still accusations of fraud, uh, people using it for fraud and other things. But Liberty Reserve was designed to be sort of like um, a semi anonymous money transfer mechanism. All around, all over the world, and all that. But yes, of course, such things are subject to abuse. So, BitGo, yes, it has, um, um, of course, it's state theoretical, by the way, which was never implemented, but BitGo had a lot of similarities to Bitcoin, right? Remember, what did I tell you? What, what did I say was the difference between Bitcoin and other DLTs, the implementation of cryptography, right? And um, cryptography to improve immutability, right? Bitcoin had that. It had cryptography, it had proof of work mechanisms, the same as Bitcoin, right? Timestamp blocks. And um, it had a lot of characteristics of Bitcoin. In fact, the coincidence is just too much, right? It's one of the reasons a lot of people really believe in Xavier Satoshi Nakamoto, but that's a story for another day, right? So the major difference is just that, okay, Bitcoin had the finance supply and just the minor differences. And this had sort of like an infinite supply, right? And of course, a lot of modern cryptocurrencies today have infinite supply. So finance supply is not a norm among um, cryptocurrencies, by the way. So if, um, if BitGold was founded today, it would just be another traditional cryptocurrency, similar to what Bitcoin um, is doing. But I think he was earlier than his time, by the way. So to the big boy, right, uh, Bitcoin. Uh, as you all know, founded in 2009 uh, by Satoshi Nakamoto, right? So I've already explained a lot. So it's depending on blockchain technology, um, everything about it is dependent on blockchain and cryptographic technology. And when a transaction is done on the Bitcoin blockchain, it is the same across now. Remember the, uh, the uh, analogy that uh, me, uh, the Victor Walker used, right? That um, the same records you see on different uh, uh, ledger men, right? So it's how you see the same transactions and the same validation on different nodes and uh, of uh, the Bitcoin blockchain. Although there has been a couple of um, a couple of actors within the Bitcoin blockchain sometimes that have one gone out, like change alter, it could, as, as I said, information alterage could be transaction information, it could be nuances like block size, how um, fees are charged, uh, the consensus mechanism, and uh, things like that. So there are a lot of nuances that can uh, be changed by a lot of people, right? So, and we've had that in the past, right, with Bitcoin Cash. In fact, the Ethereum blockchain has been fucked. Most cryptocurrencies have had their blockchains fucked, right? But um, in the case of Bitcoin, right, Yes, it has had it, but the original Bitcoin blockchain still maintains that in immutability. In, in a thousand years, right, those same transactions as it was on 10 March 2022 would still be the same. Yeah, one Bitcoin was sent from Esquire lawyers to Chad as right, and all that. So it's gonna um, it's gonna remain um, the same and all that. And fortunately. Is we have a lot of cryptocurrencies today. Um, of course, I believe Ethereum is one of the uh, has revolutionized the way we see not just uh, cryptocurrencies but also smart contracts and tokenization, right? So and we've had a lot of cryptocurrencies with a lot of good use cases come about. We've also had a lot of cryptocurrencies with not so good use cases come come about. But um, it's a growing industry. It's a growing technology and it's evolving, right? And the blockchain beyond financial transactions, like this Peter Walker said, it goes beyond that. Like there are a lot of use cases in supply chain management, in weapons manufacturing, in weapon safety, um, in, in um, logistics, in um, in even the way, in, in even in the legal sector, right? And I, I tell people, right, tell me what you do, and I'll tell you how blockchain is going to revolutionize your industry. 
<laughs> yeah, and it's going to happen. Yeah, not just blockchain, artificial intelligence, the mission of blockchain and artificial intelligence going to revolutionize um, a lot of industries. And it's, believe me, it's here to stay, right? So, as I said, right? So, um, a lot of utilities in a lot of industries are being found out every day, right? And um, it's the focus right now should be, of course, there are a lot of buzzwords, as I said, out there, the DeFi, the NFT buzzwords and things like that, the metaverse, right? These are all cool technologies, by the way. These are all cool innovations around blockchain, right? But a lot of the focus should be more of simulated benefits and should be less of simulated benefits, right? And actual tangible benefits. Like we are seeing also a few people implement and going forward, this is going to be an amazing thing. Thanks a lot for your time. My name once more is Chagas Ewu. You can find me on LinkedIn by searching Chagas Ewu, Facebook by searching Chagas Ewu. And thanks a lot for your time. Cheers. Thank you so much, Mr. Chagas Ewu. Um, that was a lovely presentation. Thank you for bringing us to the world of fintech and um, helping us um, update our knowledge base on um, the developments going on there. Um, we now move to the next presentation, uh, which will be done by Mr. Adidayo Adibaja. Uh, Mr. Adidayo Adibaja, are you here? Oh, yes, I'm very much present. Awesome. Please, you have the floor. Um, 20 so minutes much. to make your presentation. All right. All right. First and foremost, I would like to commend the effort of the, organization, uh, the organizers of this event. I've been uh, pretty much in the audience myself enjoying the past uh, knowledgeable speakers, and uh, it's been a great pleasure being here. So, uh, briefly, to cover my own section, so I'll basically be talking about uh, two uh, topics uh, which have been pretty much covered by the previous speakers. Uh, section one on the foundational principles of blockchain technology and smart contracts. And uh, second one, which is the universal and finance industry specific benefits of blockchain technology and smart contracts. Um, so briefly about myself. So my name is Adi Daya Adibaju. I'm the managing director for Jelly Reader Africa DLT, uh, which basically have uh, presence in Ghana, Nigeria, Rwanda, Kenya, Tanzania, pretty much uh, into uh, blockchain technology, uh, uh, education, consultancy and solution development. So, Let's first of, all, first of all get through uh, the blockchain trends today. We have uh, the likes of the NFT, also called the non fungible token, uh, which pretty much enables you to digitize uh, your media, your artworks, and various things you want to digitize, only creating just a single copy of it uh, for you to be able to send and receive between various parties. We also have the decentralized finance, uh, which have been able to list a, li a little bit of emphasis on in the question and answer session. Uh, basically giving uh, opportunity to every single person to become a bank, giving out loans uh, with various conditions, decentralizing the banking ecosystem. We also have the metaverse, which basically the way I would uh, define it is the, the point of intersection between the reality and the digital world, which of course have been progressing and developing for over a decade. We also have the likes of the decentralized exchanges, uh, which pretty much allows everybody uh, to be able to participate in an open plug or public uh, blockchain platform, are providing various services, uh, selling of goods and uh, buying of goods and so on. We also have tokenization, which basically as the name implies, uh, tokenization, enabling everybody or any uh, company to be able to uh, divide into bits, uh, any particular investments, might be in real estate, uh, might be in uh, supply chain or anything they want to tokenize and divide into bits, allowing anybody uh, with, without uh, you know, having a limitation of uh, uh, their own uh, uh, wealth, uh, to be able to participate in any uh, uh, investment. Well, we also have the likes of the central bank digital currency, which is currently making waves today, uh, enabling uh, people to have the opportunity presented by cryptocurrency, but just this time around only being controlled by the banks. And we also have the likes of the IEOs, the STOs, uh, the ICOs, which pretty much allows uh, people to be able to fundraise. And the likes of which we've seen, uh, I mean, in recent times, considering the wars that are taking place in uh, Ukraine and Russia, allowing uh, 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 the Ukrainian uh, uh, to be able to fundraise, you know, their, their work capabilities and also in terms of reliefs and all sorts. And they've been able to raise over 50 million uh, USD in the last couple of days. And then opening uh, the borders for people to be able to donate in various currencies. And of course, uh, doing airdrops for the people who donated. 
So these are currently the trends uh, for blockchain technology today and a lot more, much more than this. But how it all started, uh, Chia Goze has been able to cover most of this and also the previous speaker. Uh, basically in 2009, three decades, uh, 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 what was it called, uh, Charm in 1989, three decades after Charm in 1989, was able to come up with the principles of uh, uh, digital cash to undo uh, double spending. Then 2009, three decades after, we have Satoshi Nakamoto who created Bitcoin uh, using cryptography under what is called the blockchain technology. So Bitcoin by explanation uh, is what uh, stands for, is uh, the, the world's first decentralized currency offering secured, uh, transparent and distributed ledger uh, system in a peer-to-peer platform giving full control of money to its owner. Unlike the current uh, traditional system where you have to take your money to the banks and the banks should determine uh, if uh, you're able to send, how much you're able to send and what you're able to do with your money. So pretty much what Bitcoin is offering is a decentralized uh, financial system where you control and you are able to have unlimited uh, possibilities of what you can do with your money rather than just putting the money in the banks. So like I said, so the topics I'll be speaking on are basically divided into two. So let's look at the underlying concerns of the current financial systems. Uh, number one, which we, have, we can uh, discuss about is the integrity, uh, the decentralization, security and inclusiveness, and of course the privacy, which is currently being provided uh, by the current traditional banks. So the integrity aspects, how is blockchain solving this? The decentralization aspects, how is the blockchain coming in to provide uh, affordable solutions? Uh, the security, inclusiveness, and of course the privacy. So how are these being uh, addressed using blockchain technology and cryptocurrency? So this made uh, uh, the foundational principles of the technology itself. Uh, the integrity, for example, we are always uh, uh, discussing about how the ledger is being kept, who is in charge of the ledger. For example, if you are trying to make transactions between uh, two different banks in the country, uh, there is hardly uh, an opportunity for you to be guaranteed of instant settlements. And aside from that, how are you able to view the ledger to actually confirm that the person you're sending the money to has not or probably has received the money. So you have to rely solely on the, the banks to be able to provide you these details, which of course takes hours to days to weeks. So then of course you are not able to confirm if the figures you are sending is actually the, the, the right figures, which is being recorded in the ledger. It's talking about the immutability. So on the blockchain technology, these transactions are recorded and stored and retrieved in an immutable way which makes it very, very, uh, which gives it the high degree of integrity. Also talking about the decentralization in terms of peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, forms of transaction, who controls the ledger and the importance of the third party participation. What blockchain technology basically offers is an opportunity for you as a person to do a transaction with somebody regardless of where the person is in a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, format with removing the need for decentralized, uh, removing the need for a third party participation. And of course, we're talking about security uh, through the distributed ledger technology and the cryptography, as opposed to the single point of failure, which is usually being attributed to the traditional banking system we currently have today. Um, I have friends at, at the CBN who said they can't even take down the security for just a few seconds because they are always afraid of being hacked. Now, with distributed ledger technology, it provides the opportunity for the ledger, for all the banks, for the transactions to be kept in multiple places. Just like the first speaker also explained, uh, the, uh, the, the entire uh, process through which blockchain technology app, uh, functions, enabling people to keep various ledgers. And so, which means if one of the ledgers is, in, uh, is totally wrong from the remaining ledgers that have been kept by, let's say, over a thousand people, is automatically being kicked off uh, from the platform because there is a con there needs to be a consensus, there needs to be a uniformity in all the ledger, in all the detailed transactions are uh, being recorded. Then cryptography, which basically refers to the a process of encrypting and decrypting information. It's all about security. And of course, currently cryptography happens to be, uh, if not the, top, the best, one of the best ever means you can protect your data, the process of encrypting and decrypting the information. So all this provided security for the blockchain technology to be utilized in various departments, financial sector, health sector, agriculture sector, real estate, and so on. Then we also talk about the inclusiveness, availability and cross-border transactions without discrimination through global economy. Uh, for example, let's also look at what is happening across the globe. In some areas, let's, let, let's even take it to, down to our local uh, 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 existence. Let's say you want to book a flight ticket uh, to a different country, and then you are trying to make use of uh, uh, your credit card, which basically allows you to be able to spend nearer. Then, of course, you know, there, there are some airlines that you try to book because of the payment gateway they are making use of, not be able to make use of your NERA card. 
or probably you can even be in a different country and you're, you want to be able to make use of a card, but simply because your line is not roaming, you're not able to make a transaction because you can't receive it OTP. So all these uh, kind of uh, makes it difficult to have a global economy where you can easily spend what you have to get what you want in whatever situation you have. But with blockchain technology, you're able to make cross-border transactions and it's often, every time it's always available for you to use. So you can send money in re regardless of uh, the time, type of volume of, of the type, time of the day, you can send money anytime to anybody anywhere across the globe. So which means you can transact, you can have dealings with anybody regardless of where they have, sell and receive, or send and receive and so on. Then of course, we talk about the privacy, truly trustless trust peer-to-peer -peer system where your identity is secured as opposed to the third party verification and validation our platforms making money of your data. So with blockchain technology, you can always be guaranteed of your privacy despite the fact that you're also transacting with you know, numerous people across the globe. So then what exactly is blockchain technology? So I'll just be defining this based on what you can already see on your screen. It's been, uh, 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 the emphasis has been given, it's been explained in detail by the previous speakers. So by definition, you can see it as a distributed public database, you know, that leverages cryptography and peer-to-peer -peer technology to group data into blocks and store them in an immutable chain of transactions. This has already been uh, 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 divided and explained in detail by the first speaker. So what we mean by distributed public database is simply, as the name implies, it is distributed. It is contained, is the same information I'm having on my own ledger, the same information you are having, what you are having, and everybody's having. So it's still the same information, which means you all have the incentives to keep the same data. Leverages cryptography, and cryptography, like I've explained earlier, is basically the method of encrypting and decrypting information. So which means what is sent from one party to the other is only decrypted by the party who is intended to have it, which is the person who is having the private key. Peer-to-peer -peer basically is like having transactions between two people uh, you know, without the third party having to uh, validate or to verify the authenticity of this transaction. So it's just between two people, reducing the time, reducing the cost, and also grouped into data and blocks and stored in an immutable chain of transaction. Data and blocks, you can just see that as basically how you keep your files in the office every single day. So you can decide to open a file for every single one hour, then all the transactions coming into your, through your office for this one hour will be kept in the file. Then the next file will be for the next one hour. So you can call this uh, the blocks because blocks on the chain, the blockchain are usually stored, let's say some in 30 seconds or some in every three, three seconds. So all the transactions related to this particular uh, uh, time frame is stored in these blocks before it moves to the next blocks. And all these blocks are all chained together. So that is how you come about, uh, how you come about the name of uh, blockchain. So simply put, it's a system in which a record of transactions made in Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency are maintained across several computers that are linked in peer-to-peer -peer network. So then let's talk about smart contracts. Of course, Chia Gozi has also been able to lay more emphasis on this, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, so I like the question being asked in the, in the Q&A section, people want to know what smart contract is. As a lawyer, you can see a smart contract basically as the same contract, you know, that uh, is attributed to every agreement uh, that is being entered by two or more parties. But this time around, these are protocols, you know, running on the blockchain that are digitally facilitated, uh, that facilitate the verification control or execution of any agreement in forms of transactions. Uh, let's take into consideration that transactions this time around may not necessarily be financial transactions. Transactions include any digital forms of uh, exchanges. So let's say you want to send a uh, music, uh, a document which is digitized you know, to, to somebody. This is also a transaction. Let's say you want to send a document which is also digitized, a digital form of a document to somebody on the blockchain is also a transaction. So transaction basically refers to any digital assets being transacted between two parties or more. So smart contracts, they are faster, they are cheaper, and they are more secured way of executing and managing agreements. And why are they faster? Because they require just a peer-to-peer -peer forms of transactions. Why are they cheaper? The middleman is already being removed. You don't need, uh, uh, sorry to say, you don't really need all the lawyers to come together before you can have an agreement. And how is it secured? It is using the distributed ledger technology and also cryptography to encrypt and decrypt the information. And of course, there are also self-executing contracts processing all transactions of various types, removing the need for third party or middleman. So basically this is what smart contract is all about. So um, benefits of smart contracts include the autonomy and savings, of course, you are able to minimize the amount of money you are spending in creating contracts all the time. In terms of backup, you know, we are using the distributed ledger technology, which is also immutable. So all the smart contracts that are being deployed on the blockchain are always stored on the blockchain. 
you know, of course, you have the safety, you have the speed, you have the accuracy, and all these maintain the benefits of smart contracts as opposed you know, to the traditional way of doing things where you have to go through the process of having paper written documents, enforcing them, and then also uh, catering for court proceedings for the breach of contract. All these are all coded in the protocols and uploaded on the blockchain to self-execute. So these are the benefits of the smart contract. So, you, 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 you can tend to ask the question that if you have Bitcoin, then why are other cryptocurrencies created? Now, Chia Gose was able to make mention that we currently have thousands of cryptocurrencies. That is true. Then why are they all created? After Bitcoin, we had uh, the Ethereum, we had Ripples, we have the, the Stablecoin, various ones. We have the NXT, we have Cardano, we have Polkadot, Chainlink. Let's start with the Ethereum. Ethereum basically was created to facilitate smart contract transactions on the blockchain network enabling you to have what we currently have today, uh, the, the likes of uh, decentralized finances, the likes of uh, uh, our metaverse became, becoming a team, uh, the likes of uh, NFTs, and the, the likes of uh, programmable uh, uh, money, and so on and so forth. And all these are usually possible with the use of smart contracts. So Ethereum came to create this scenario, enabling people to provide uh, more liquidity, more use cases for their money, instead of just allowing it to sit in the wallet. Then we have Ripple, basically, which came to, uh, to foster faster transactions. And we, then we have this, uh, the stable coin like, uh, like Tether, like uh, BUSD and so on and so forth, which basically is to uh, uh, foster more uh, uh, adoption uh, for people who want to be able to have a stable source of income rather than having a volatile market. You know, if you receive uh, a USD today, let it remain one USD. And not tomorrow, it can become like five USD in value or probably it can become even lesser than that. Then we have uh, the proof of stake consensus algorithm. NXT be the first one in 2013, then Cardano, and we have a lot of uh, uh, delegated proof of stake as well today. Basically what this came to achieve is to minimize the amount of uh, consumption, power consumption on the blockchain. We have all these previous ones uh, are listed with Bitcoin, the Ethereum, they make use of what we call the proof of work consensus algorithm, which basically utilizes a lot of power, a, little, a lot of computing uh, uh, requirements by the machines used in mining. But with the proof of stake consensus algorithm, you're able to use just a little amount of power, and of course, makes it uh, sustainable. Then we have Polkadot, Chainlink, and the likes. Basically, what the blockchain technology has been uh, uh, battling with uh, for the past, let's say, the past decade, uh, before the advent of Polkadot, Chainlink, uh, the Aldo network, and so on, which basically offers interoperability, is the communication between these uh, 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 blockchain uh, platforms, which are operating in silo. It's difficult for you to have an interaction between uh, various blockchain platforms, let's say Ethereum, uh, Cardano, uh, uh, even uh, the stablecoin networks and so on. But with the likes of the Polkadot and Chainlink, it's actually possible for you to have instant settlements or interoperability between all these networks, which is pretty much, you can see it as, you know, bringing all the banks in Nigeria to operate a single node or to operate a single, uh, 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 what's it called, a ledger, uh, which is instantly they become a consortium blockchain. So having instant settlement, having uh, instant communication between the banks for you to be able to view uh, where the transactions are currently, uh, where it, uh, or in this case of uh, field transactions, for you to easily reverse them and so on and so forth. Then also we have the forks of uh, Bitcoin, which are Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin Gold. And basically why we have these forks is simply because of uh, uh, um, uh, the situation where you have several people who already gave consent you know, to a specific uh, blockchain platform, then all of a sudden, because of uh, some series of upgrade updates, uh, some uh, little, little changes to the conditions of these networks. So they decided to, to have a fork because they are no longer giving their consent to the way the blockchain platform is progressing. So we can also see this from the perspective of uh, having multiple parties, you know, under the same country. In Nigeria, we have the PDP, uh, the APC, which are still the same Nigerians, but we are operating under a different protocol entirely but for the same purpose of having uh, a free financial or uh, a financial freedom and so on and so forth. So these are specific reasons today where we have uh, various cryptocurrencies out there. Each one of them coming uh, to provide something that they feel uh, people need, but it's not being provided adequately by the predecessors. So uh, moving to the section two, so the universal uh, and finance industry specific benefits of blockchain technology and smart contracts. So how exactly are the blockchain technology being utilized? in the financial sector and in the universal industry. Then, of course, the smart contracts. So what you are looking at here is uh, the basic use cases for blockchain technology coupled with smart contracts being utilized in peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending, in peer-to-peer -peer insurance, in event-driven insurance. Uh, 
insurance, for example, let's take the insurance uh, sector. Uh, how exactly has it been able to, to scale using blockchain technology? A lot of people would argue that uh, the, the traditional insurance sector is basically uh, uh, something similar to being a scam environment because how exactly a lot of people tend to insure their property for as little as 5,000 there and so on and so forth. But then, you know, with the, with the amount of money they are using to insure their property, they, are, they know specifically that they are not getting um, anything out of it, huh? should in case anything happens to their vehicle, anything happens to whatever it is they are trying to insure. And even the people who are actually spending huge amounts of money to insure farmlands, uh, to insure their house against fire hazard, how exactly are they, are they getting uh, uh, their premium after anything that is uh, supposed to happen, after the, uh, the, the inevitable happens? It takes a long period of time for them to usually get their, uh, their, their premium being disbursed to their account. But with blockchain technology coupled with the likes of the Oracle smart contract, uh, the smart contract environment itself it enables people who are providing uh, insurance for their properties uh, to get instant disbursement once the conditions are met. We're talking about Oracle Smart Contract being fed with uh, uh, the, the, the first industrial revolutionary technology that the first speaker made mention of, the likes of IoT sensors, you know, being plugged into the smart contract environment provided by the Oracle Smart Contract to provide signals, which then create the condition for the smart contract to execute. Let's say a house is burning, for example, and the house was already insured. So the, the IoT sensors in the house provides a signal that the, the house is currently being uh, bombed, uh, or probably even uh, uh, totally incinerated. So this, the, the sensor in the house is able to provide the information required you know, for the smart contract to automatically kick in. So once the signal is being sent to the smart contract through the Oracle uh, uh, database, of course, so the smart contract then automatically executes, providing, uh, providing the premium uh, to the person who insured the property instantly without having to go through uh, the, uh, the rigorous uh, stress, you know, the time and also a lot of other stress involved in claiming uh, the, 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 uh, the basic thing is deserved, you know, uh, getting the, the, the premium paid into his account. All these are done smartly, automatically in an instant, probably a couple of seconds. So which can tend to, uh, tend to give uh, you know, credibility back to the insurance sector. We also have the foreign exchange instant settlements, cross-border payments, our trade finances. All these are various applications, which of course provide transparency in an immutable way uh, to the way we do business today. Real-time payment is no longer an issue. You can easily send money from here to Ukraine in a couple of seconds, which can't be done with the traditional systems you currently have. And of course, in a cheaper way, trusted way, of course, using blockchain technology. And all these are also powered using smart contracts. For example, we also have a various applications of blockchain in fintech, uh, the mortgage sector, uh, the, the, the business to business services, offering insurance payments, or trust escrows. We have various applications where blockchain can easily, I mean, anywhere you look at and you see the need for a new table or uh, database, anywhere you look at and you see the need for transparency, anywhere you look at and you see the need for a distributed ledger for everybody to be able to have a, a copy of the ledger. Anywhere you look at and you see the need for faster, cheaper transactions and removing the middlemen, who are of course causing a lot of issues like a biased uh, processing of loan payments and so on and so forth. So all these areas require blockchain uh, technology to be able to foster faster adoption. And of course, to be able to instill trust in the users of the platform. We also have the, uh, the, the cards and payment sector, interbank settlement, like I've explained earlier, uh, uh, cross-currency transactions, you're able to automatically exchange uh, your Naira to USD, uh, uh, to, or to pound sterling, and so on and so forth. Also making micro payment. You know, today, well, in Nigeria, you know, back in the days, we used to spend Kobo and then uh, as little as five Naira, but today we can't do that anymore. Even on the blockchain, using Bitcoin uh, as a means of uh, payment, we can still spend Satoshi which is the micro uh, uh, quantity of Bitcoin itself. Now, with the, with the blockchain technology, we can easily go back. Should in case we have anything that we can easily uh, you know, uh, uh, buy with our cobble, we can still go back and spend this micro payment, pay uh, a 99 cobble into somebody's account or probably pay you know, 1,000 cobble units into somebody's account. So you're able to make micro payments at uh, uh, a toll gate, you know, at various places. And of course, you're able to instantly disburse loyalty a point uh, to your customers if you case you want to offer loyalty programs without having to go through centralized systems. All this can be done using blockchain technology. Also looking at the capital market, you can e easily issue smart bonds, equity issuance, OTC derivatives, or a purchase agreement and so on. 
and all these are possibly utilizing blockchain as a crypto and also smart contracts to be able to smartly execute all these uh, 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 opportunities. Then of course, we have the banking, the commercial lending using DeFi, you have the supply chain financing, uh, the trade finance, we have the mortgage lending, the KYC processing. Uh, specifically, you know, in the blockchain, uh, 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 let me say the blockchain ecosystem, uh, basically you can easily transact with varieties of people because you can easily verify uh, the history of the accounts they are using, whom they have been able to transact with, how much they are capable of transacting. So all this without you having to go through a third party. So you have uh, the KYC you need to be able to do all this. And of course, it makes it easier for you to trust you know, the person you're doing transaction with, even though you don't know the person, the person is still anonymous, but you're able to see their address, you're able to see the previous transaction, you're also able to trust them because of the smart contract uh, that is guiding the transaction in between uh, your peer-to-peer -peer, uh, platforms. We also have uh, applications in the utility like document management. You know, everything is going on the blockchain, everything is going on the digital uh, 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 infrastructure these days. Yeah, you have to try to save the planet, of course, by cutting down, you know, the amount of paper that you are, you are using in your various offices. Also looking at the bill payments, the asset digit digitalization, the contracts management, all these are done or could be done or is being done using blockchain uh, technology. And let's look at the global perspective. Blockchain benefits, how exactly is it impacting our various businesses? Talking about trust, it enables trust between parties who don't know each other. I mean, we have billions of people across the globe. So for you to be able to do business with somebody, let's say somebody in the United Kingdom, you don't need to know the person face-to-face. -face. You don't need to see the person before you can transact with them. So blockchain brings about the trust for you to do business with somebody who is anonymous to you. Then of course, decentralized structure enabling real-time data sharing among businesses like suppliers and distributors while reducing the points of weaknesses. And also this can be done, removing the third party in between trying to provide verification and validation uh, services which can be expensive to you doing businesses. We also have the improved security and privacy, which of course, like I said earlier, is provided using cryptography and the DLT aspects of our blockchain technology, creating an unalterable records of transactions, you know, with end-to-end -end encryption, which reduces fraud and authorized activities. We also have the opportunity of reducing costs, increasing the speed, increasing traceability and visibility for every transaction being made from one point to the other, increasing the immutability, then individual control of data, your data is yours. But if it's not on the blockchain, it is not your data. And of course, it needs to be totally controlled by you because you control the private keys. Your public addresses, your public keys, what you're using getting transactions into your account. But your private key enables you to control your data. So it gives entities the ability to decide what digital data they want to share and with whom and for how long with limits enforced by smart contracts. And also tokenization. You know, let's take, for example, the real estate industry in Nigeria right now, which is already, uh, of course, being limited to the wealthy. People who can afford, let's say, $1,000 you know, to invest in the real estate sector, to buy lands and to speculate over time, or probably to even afford uh, thousands of USD you know, to buy properties and then put it on the market uh, to get rental values. But with tokenization, it makes it possible and creates more liquidity for the real estate market. Let's say, for example, Dangote is trying to build, you know, multi-billion uh, uh, dollars worth of uh, property in the, uh, 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 in the uh, what's it called, the oil and gas sector. Now, we can easily tokenize this, enabling various investors to come together to contribute the amount of money required. And eventually, they'll all be getting, you know, based on the snapshots of whatever amount of tokens uh, they're having in their wallet, they'll be getting the dividend automatically from every single transaction that took place in this particular scenario. So you can easily tokenize and then crowdfund any investments that you want to crowdfund, making it easier for you to easily find liquidity for your investments, of course, and a variety of other things possible using tokenization of risk, uh, assets. Then the last one, innovation. Leaders across multiple industries are exploring and implementing blockchain-based system to solve intractable uh, problems and improve long-standing cumbersome practices, such as verifying the info on the job resume we have in various platforms today offering uh, uh, digitized uh, you know, uh, result verification on the blockchain, which enables you uh, as, an, as an applicant for a job, not to go back to your institution to claim that you want to get uh, all these uh, documents, you know, uh, uh, that uh, you want to get uh, your, your copy of uh, uh, your certificate, uh, you know, to be able to uh, verify, uh, validate yourself in front of your employers. The employer can easily validate the authenticity of your certificate on the blockchain. And all these are currently driving innovation in the space. 
like I said, we have the metaverse also, you know, becoming a team today where you can easily buy, you know, digital uh, plots of land in the metaverse, uh, affording you the opportunity of actually having business deals in the metaverse and so on and so forth. So all of these benefits, when you look at them, it's actually applicable to varieties of the sectors uh, that we currently have today. The agricultural sector, the real estate, uh, the health sectors, uh, uh, the education sector, the financial sector, and so on and so forth. So blockchain technology coupled with the smart contract creates innovations, creates new business models for us to be able to you know, uh, strive in whatever situation or whatever sectors we find ourselves. Uh, so with this, I'll be coming to the end of my presentation. I hope it was worth it. Uh, thank you very much. So think blockchain and experience blockchain. Uh, so uh, we'll be waiting in line for the question and answers. Uh, thank you very much once again to the organizers. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Adedayo. Adebaja, that was a very, very, very good presentation. Thank you. And um, thank you for extending our knowledge on blockchain and its applications. Um, without further ado, we'll be going to the last session. Um, I want to quickly remind you that if you can actually engage with our panelists on the Q&A um, part of the Zoom app, right? There's been a lot of engagement in question and answer, so you can do well to check that out. So you don't miss out on the knowledge sharing session as well. So um, we go um, to the last session, which you know is simply about um, the regulatory and um, the legal um, landscape, right? Of, of blockchain, fintech, and smart contracts. And with this, we have uh, Mr. Max, and um, we'll be taking over this. Mr. Max, you have the floor. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. I'll just try to share my screen. Yeah, yes, we can, sir. Okay. Um, can you see my screen as well? Sorry, let me get into present, uh, presentation mode. Uh, sorry, my apologies. Uh, the, the, Zoom, the Zoom function is blocking out my uh, presentation uh, option. Ah, where do I get this? It's like a slideshow. Okay, so you can see my presentation, right? Yes, we can, sir, clearly. Okay, yeah, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I'll be looking at two, I mean, I want to first of all acknowledge all the speakers who have gone before me for a wonderful job. I mean, my work is made a lot easier. Uh, I mean, of course, I'll be coming from the practitioner's perspective, so I'll just try to breeze through a couple of things and since our time is uh, significantly uh, fast spent. So I'm looking at two things essentially, crypto regulation, uh, adoption and challenges, and then market growth in fintech and blockchain. So this is just a quick uh, re um, outline of what we are looking at, but I'll just jump through for the sake of time. Yeah, so introduction, you know, I mean, we've heard a lot from the speakers who have gone before me who have done a marvelous job in introducing some of these words, but the question that always comes to mind is, are these things just, um, Buzzwords, is there real value or it's the uh, or, or it's just you know people just coming up with a lot of things? But I hope from what you've heard from the excellent speakers who have gone before me, you'd agree with me that these are not buzzwords, there's a lot of value behind them. Yeah. So crypto regulation, I'll just start with regulation and look at a few things. So I mean um, the speakers before me have spoken a lot about. So I don't think I'll uh, dwell too much on it. I'll just point out something that one rough parallel of uh, consensus algorithms this is just the way that blockchains within themselves operate to ensure they can keep uh, an accurate record. And the speakers have already spoken about them, proof of work, proof of stake. But I'm just saying one rough example we can look at would be like elections. So essentially there's a consensus or a, a, a protocol, let me call it that, that governs who becomes the president. So you have to get the majority vote but that's not enough. You have to get 25% of the vote in two thirds of the states of the federation. And then of course the other requirement, you of course, you know, in the Nigerian context have to win your election petition. You have to be sworn in by the chief justice of Nigeria and all of that. So in a sense, those are the things that come together to, uh, you know, verify the fact that the person is the president. So in a sense, that's what a consensus algorithm does. It verifies transactions and ensures that there, there are internal rules governing that ledger to maintain that there's you know, accuracy as to the information contained in the ledger. So I won't dwell too much on this on um, 
the popular consensus algorithms because these are kind of internal regulatory mechanisms. That's why I'm just touching them, how the uh, blockchains regulate themselves internally. So proof of work we've mentioned that just to give an example with them, uh, Elon Musk. So the Bitcoin blockchain is this proof of work, which is quite um, uh, energy intensive. So a lot of the miners have moved to China where they use coal power to power the uh, power their, their very huge computers that run this proof of work state. So because of that, Elon Musk at the point said you, um, uh, Tesla was pulling out of adopting Bitcoin because they felt uh, adopting Bitcoin was encouraging environmental pollution because of the use of coal and all of that. So it just tells you, just trying to show you some of the, how this concept actually play out in real life in terms of regulation. So another popular consensus algorithm is the proof of stake, which um, is less capital in, uh, energy intensive. And then instead of using a proof of work where you know the computers risk solve a problem, and that's why they consume a lot of energy, proof of stake rather is the computers connected or the nodes, which is a technical term rather um, the amount you have invested in terms of tokens you hold in that network is what determines you know, your, your capacity to validate transactions. So I'll just run along. So getting to government regulation, the first question we should ask ourselves, how do you regulate what you can't control? Because I believe it was Mr. Adebanjo who has explained to us that when it comes to uh, uh, you know, differentiating between um, central bank digital currencies and cryptocurrencies, cryptocurrencies the core of them really is the fact that they are decentralized. So there's no central regulating authority. So the question is, if governments want to regulate, you know, blockchain, cryptocurrency, and all, how do you regulate something you can't control? Since control is in the hands of the nodes and the, uh, peer, the peers who are, uh, you, you know, who control that network. So one option, which I believe is a healthy option, is self-regulation. Where players in the blockchain industry decide to come together to regulate themselves just to ensure that you know, some of the bad press that cryptocurrency and blockchain has caught in recent years that could minimize some of those things. Of course, we know them. People complain about the fact that, um, you know, cryptocurrency was used, for instance, during ransomware, one acquired ransomware, for instance, where you just log into your computer, your computer is locked, and you get a message saying, we have locked your computer and encrypted it. If you want access to your computer, then you have to pay XYZ Bitcoin to an XYZ wallet. So some of those bad, bad press. So an example I'm giving is the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, FINRA in the US, which is an SRO, and SRO is a self-regulatory organization of stock broker or, or security dealers. It used to be called National Association of Security Dealers. That's where the word, that's where NASDAQ, that we all know the popular um, uh, stock market indices comes from NASDAQ. So in Nigeria, for instance, unfortunately, my brother, Senator Hain, is not here. He told us more about Cyber is the president of cyber and stakeholders in blockchain technology association of Nigeria. So they are doing some work in terms of self-regulation, ensuring that within the industry themselves, there's some measure of regulation and then you avoid government clamping down with you know, too hard regulation. Because if the industry itself is allowed to regulate itself, then they'll be able to provide regulations that are nuanced to capture some of the uh, some of the peculiarities of the industry. But government just come with a sledgehammer like we already have uh, you know, as it were now. So, one thing I want us to look back at now is to zoom out a little and look at conventional financial regulation just to understand because I know the CBN has caught a lot of flack in terms of uh, its approach towards regulating particular cryptocurrencies and all, but it's good we have some understanding. And, uh, and I'm glad that a few of the speakers already hinted at some of these things. So the thing is that uh, money essentially is a fiction created by the state to facilitate the exchange of value because to an extent, I mean, money in those days used to be backed up by maybe gold or some other precious um, material. But at the moment, we know it's no longer backed up by that. So what you call fiat currency, simply you know, a fiction that the government creates and says everybody must use this to exchange value within the sovereign domain of that state. So regulation of the financial sector is necessary to ensure there's stability and confidence. Because when it comes to money, stability and confidence is what really drives. When people lose confidence in a currency, then that currency is a problem. So banking regulation consists of two things broadly. I mean, there are many other things, but two uh, foundational things, licensing. So you have to be licensed to play in the financial sector. And then secondly, supervision. Because if you are licensed, then you're, you know, the threat of um, supervision is that if we supervise you and find you are not doing what you should do, then we take your license away. So that, those are the two cardinal things that you know, uh, banking regulation is, is built on. So of course, the current um, uh, banking regulation law in Nigeria would be the Hofiara, the banks, and other financial institutions act 2020. Of course, there are other laws, CBN Act and you know, Currency Act and all of that. But 
to a large extent, Profi Act 2020 is uh, one of the most recent developments on the block. It's largely based on what we call Parcel 3. So Parcel 3 is um, a series of accords. They are um, more like internationally agreed set of measures developed you know, by uh, central, central banks across the world or bank regulators uh, around the world. And Parcel 3 particularly was designed as a fallout of the financial, global financial crisis in 2007-2009. So what Basel III call has largely is you know, to ensure that banks have adequate capital, you know, then to set frameworks for stress testing of banks, just to know how banks will fare if there's, um, a, you know, a, if there's um, a, a, you know, a contingency. So we could do something like look at the 10 uh, largest creditors of the bank. If they all go bankrupt, would that bank be able to stand up just to ensure that the regulator always has a healthy market? And of course, market liquidity risk also is another thing that uh, Basel III covers. These are just all uh, geared to ensure that banks are healthy and can withstand the shocks that come. I mean, for instance, like the COVID shock or like the one in Ukraine at the moment, you want to be sure that banks will not go down just because of that. So the idea of financial systems you know, is just to keep the system healthy and avoid this dreaded one. So run on the bank. So the run on the bank is a, it's a very elementary um, thing, but it just simply means where people lose confidence in the bank or in the banking system, and they all want to take out their cash from the bank. Because you need to realize that people put their money in the bank. The bank immediately lends that money. So if I put my money, one million in the bank, the bank would lend that money to the bank okay, while it's doing the refinery. But any day I go to the bank, the bank is able to give me my money back. So the idea of running a bank is that we want to avoid the scenario where everybody goes to the bank on the same day and says we want our deposit back. Uh, we want all our deposit back. If that happens, there's no bank that will be able to meet um, you know, all of that at the same time. So you want to avoid that scenario. Because a run on the bank is usually what happens. I mean, to a large extent, what we have now in Nigeria is a, a run on the filling station. Everybody wants to buy fuel. People would normally go to the filling station and maybe buy a half tank or a quarter tank. All want to get their tanks filled. So because of that pressure, everybody's in the filling station. We suddenly have a crisis on our hands. So you want to avoid that in the banking, se banking sector. Then there's what we call the financial system contagion. The idea is that financial systems are linked. All the players are linked. Because when it comes to banks, for instance, banks act together. So take a typical example of the Dangote refinery now. It's not one bank financing, it's a consortium of banks, you know, and then there are all kinds of, you know, um, arrangements made. So it means that if one bank in that sector has a problem, it's affecting the other bank and it could spread. So the global crisis started in the US, but it spread quickly from the US spread to Europe and to other parts of the world because financial systems are new, financial um, uh, organizations like banks and insurance companies trade with each other. So if anything happens to one of them, it spreads just like the COVID virus should spread. So that is one thing that banking regulation is uh, always careful of looking at. So what is the role of innovation in causing the global, or what, what was the role sorry, of innovation in causing the global financial crisis? So amongst many other causes, one of the causes of the global financial crisis was that there was innovative new products created by uh, banks and you know, some insurance companies and that allowed them to it to extend mortgages, very risky mortgages to people who ordinarily would not have gotten mortgages you know, before this time. So what happened was that, I mean, it's, it's a long story, but the whole idea was that one of the key things since I was what they call a credit default swap, which is kind of an insurance company that says, if the person who are giving this mortgage fails, then the insurance company would pay you know, for his failure to settle or pay up you know, on his mortgage payment. So that triggered the crisis. So what happened essentially was that these were innovative products. People thought about how can we extend mortgage people who have been enriched by mortgages, good uh, motive. But unfortunately, the regulators were kind of caught um, napping. They just did not really look at that innovation to find out what exactly is behind innovation. And that is how we had the global financial crisis. So the second question is, are fintechs currently leading us down that same route? Are fintechs leading us that same route? Well, I would say, in a sense, if we are not careful, because a lot of fintechs are doing great stuff, but you have to be careful because a lot of fintechs are also hiding under the umbrella of fintechs taking money from people and not. I mean, of course, we already have some of the examples in the agri-tech sector, for instance. A lot of the agri-tech companies are folded up. People are not getting their money back because there was no regulation. It was innovative, raise money from people, give them shares in farms, and, you know, and they get returns on it. Innovative, right? But then they get the back-end regulation to be sure they were doing what they said they were doing. So then another word we want to look at, I, okay, I think I'll skip it for now. We'll look at it. Regulatory arbitrage is what fintech strive on. So regulatory arbitrage simply means looking at regulations and spotting what I'll call the loopholes or where regulations don't exactly cover and building a business model along those lines. So that that way you avoid the constraints of the regulation, but at the same time you enjoy the benefits 
of that economic activity. So typical example is that when it comes to banks, the basic regulation for banks is that for you to be able to take deposits from the public, you need to have a banking license. But if you have a banking license, you have to keep all kinds of things. You've mentioned Basel three. you have to maintain capital, you have to you know, uh, do what we call um, a fractional lending. So many re regulations come on you. But imagine if you are able to build your business model to avoid taking deposits, but at the same time offer banking services. So for instance, peer-to-peer -peer lending. You are not taking deposits from people. You only you know, connect somebody who has money and the person who needs money and they lend to each other, you take a cut of it. So you are in a sense extending loans like banks would do, but you are not under bank regulation. You don't have to keep all those regulations. So that makes um, fintechs a lot more nimble. They are able to uh, move quicker than traditional banks because banks are subject to a lot of regulation. So I'm conscious of my time. I'll just run along. So crypto, uh, you know, the crypto, the CBN crypto bank. So just this, um, uh, just the little fun picture. So was it CBN versus the fintechs? So this is a funny picture, you know, of um, the posture of the central bank towards fintechs at the point. So we can compare and contrast a few things that have happened that gives the impression that our CBN is, um, is against the development of fintech. So there was a, during the NSAS accounts of um, a couple of people were frozen because they found them using cryptocurrencies to move money efficiently when the banking system would not have moved it that efficiently. I mean, Mr. Adebajo, and I believe Chiago has also touched on that very well. So freezing of account of wealth management fintech, so including rise best and best. we'll talk about that shortly. But contrast the fact that the CBN has created uh, you know, the central bank digital currency that the e-Naira, which is not a bad initiative, even though, I mean, I think there are still a lot of things that should have been done. Then, of course, licensing of uh, payment service fintechs. The large extent, the, the central bank has been to bring on board a few of these fintechs and are doing great stuff. Then the open banking framework is also another thing the CBN has created that will be of huge benefit to fintechs. But like you say, we are still watching, you know, watching how this will play out. So we move to um, the case of CBN versus RiceBet. So it's, I'll just give a quick uh, background to this case. What happened was that the CBN governor acting under section 97.3 of the Bofia 2020, um, uh, you know, of course, remember the CBN had passed the supply area earlier, uh, banning, you know, in a sense, cryptocurrency or trading or dealing in cryptocurrency and are directing banks to shut down all bank accounts of people who trade in cryptocurrency. So um, the CBN got the order from the Federal High Court freezing the account of the listed uh, fintechs. You can see the rice vest, bamboo, chaka, Trove, TTL, and, and, and all of that. But what happened was that the, um, the, the, these fintechs were able to get um, to, to go back to the court, bring an application, and in ruling what the judge said is very important, that the court discharged the order. And the court found that because he held that cryptocurrency is not illegal in Nigeria, because the CBN cannot by circular create criminal offense. So that's very important to know that. So far as Nigeria is concerned, and by the ruling of the court, cryptocurrencies are not illegal. So I'll say um, the fintechs, you know, were able to defeat the CBN via a technical uh, knockout, just like our brother um, Adesanya, uh, Israel Adesanya, with the last trial vendor. So, so we look at adoption now. I have to speed up. I can see time is not on my side. So accept. So adoption seems about acceptability. That's what it just means at the bottom, at the bottom, at the base of it. How people are ready to accept cryptocurrency as a tender for ex, you know, in exchange of value. So confidence to use it as money. So it's certainly on the rise as knowledge increases, but don't confuse you know, adoption with people uh, using cryptocurrency for trading or speculation purposes. That is quite different. That's why I like the chain analysis. Um, uh, chain analysis is uh, you know, a company that did uh, you know, your research to uh, look at countries that have adopted cryptocurrency the most. And I like the analysis because they made sure they accounted for uh, uh, people who simply are into cryptocurrency for trading and speculation. But trying to look at people who really use it for transactions in terms of payments and accepting it in exchange for goods and services. So Nigeria ranks um, number six on their for 2021 in terms of adoption of cryptocurrency. So Nigeria is doing well on that front. Then acceptability to adoption of cryptocurrency versus fiat. So like I've explained, fiat is uh, money that is not backed up with any store of value necessarily, but is simply by faith in the government that has issued that currency. So when it comes to Fiat, I, I won't waste too much time on this. The simple thing is that the government forces you to adopt their currency. But with cryptocurrencies, it has to be organic. People have to trust and have confidence to adopt it. So for instance, there was a time that the CBN uh, was concerned that the Nigerian economy was getting dollarized and they passed the uh, currency substitution and dollarization of the Nigerian economy circular. That was in 2015, but of course that circular has not exactly worked. Templars put out a very beautiful uh, article where they started the CBN and to a large extent, I agree with them. So, 
just know that when it comes to adoption, cryptocurrency needs that organic adoption. But with fear, the government just legislates it and all their nuclear weapons and all that is there to enforce it. So if you don't, they throw you in jail. If you refuse to accept you know, or adopt the currency of the nation, then you will not be able to live in that nation. Then another issue is um, in the cryptocurrency market is always adoptions and rumors of adoption. So we're always hearing, oh, Amazon adopts Bitcoin, uh, Tesla is about to accept payments in Bitcoins, but it's never always like that. You always see these companies coming out. So we have two articles here where um, Tesla seemed to have agreed and at some point pulled back. Same thing with Amazon as well, even though we recently had Amazon wants to. But every time you hear that news, you know, people get excited and then you see the crypto markets jumping up. So of course, another thing that has also created a, a hike in the crypto market currently is the uh, Russia and Ukraine war because a lot of um, uh, people are you know finding it easier to use cryptocurrency to transact as a lot of infrastructure is um, destroyed in Ukraine and banks are not able to function properly so people have to fall back on cryptocurrency so that's one advantage just like Mr. Badger mentioned the fact that there's no central authority so there's no single point of failure so if, even if the bank goes down Bitcoin is still working because all the nodes even if some nodes go down once other nodes are up and running the currency is still running. So that's another advantage of cryptocurrency. So what are the challenges with cryptocurrencies? So legal and tax status. Like I've said, the Nigerian law is clear. Cryptocurrency is not illegal. It's not a crime to give in cryptocurrency as far as um, the federal court is concerned. However, cryptocurrency just stays in that gray area. It's not illegal. It's not legal. So it's a little funny. And then another problem is how do you treat it for tax uh, purposes and how do you treat it for financial reporting purposes? So if your company is holding cryptocurrency, how do you reflect that? In your book of account. So it's, it's a little tricky. It, you can't exactly call it cash since it's not legal tender. You can't call it a financial asset also because you know there are criteria that financial assets have to meet. So, but you could call it an intangible asset, which is the treatment that even the uh, um, ACA seems to favor. And you could also call it an inventory. If you hold cryptocurrency to trade in the course of your normal business, then for trading purposes, then it means you can account for it in your books as inventory. Then another challenge that cryptocurrency has is anonymity or what's called pseudo-anonymity. So most cryptocurrencies are not anonymous. People are just giving cryptocurrencies a bad name and make it look like, oh, cryptocurrencies are anonymous. In fact, they, they, if we are talking about anonymity, cash, fiscal fiat cash, that is $1,000 notes or $100 bills, is actually the most anonymous kind of money you can find. Because if I use it and we meet in the dark alley on the exchange, there's no way to trace it back necessarily to me. But with cryptocurrencies, theoretically, it's possible Trace backward. There are some cryptocurrencies that offer, you know, heightened anonymity and were used, you know, um, during, for instance, ransomware attacks. So one major area, one challenge that cryptocurrency has issues of KYC, know your customer, and you know, uh, AML, that's anti-money laundering, and CFT, countering the financing of terrorism measures. So these are some of the things that um, self-regulatory organizations like Cybank should work on. How do we ensure that we have some level of KYC within the sector so that you know we don't give it a bad name? So we quickly move on to the last part of my presentation, which is a market growth in fintech and blockchain. So, I mean, depending on what, whose report you are looking at, I, I believe it was a chair who gave us a report, 800 million raised by fintechs in Nigeria in 2021. I found another report that says $3 billion. You know, you can't really be sure, but when it comes to, to, uh, to uh, a lot of this, is because the money is raised private, you know, to private equity and venture capital. And when it comes to private equity and venture capital, you are not always able to get full information. So that's why the record seems to be important. The bottom line is that Nigerian fintechs are raising a lot of money. People are putting their trust in the innovation happening in the Nigerian fintech sector. And that is why a lot of money is pouring in. So I've spoken about rise of fintech and shadow banks. I talked about regulatory arbitrage. So that's essentially how um, fintechs are able to rise and to offer. You know, we call them shadow banks because they are not licensed banks. But in a sense, because they have seen a loophole in, in regulation, they're able to use that to offer what would have been normally a normal banking service. So then funding of fintechs and private equity, we just mentioned that. So, I mean, essentially, private equity and venture capital are non-public sources of funding for companies, especially startups. So it proves useful for fintechs because fintechs don't have that regulatory structure to be able to go to the um, stock exchange and raise money from the public. So rather, they'll be able to raise through these informal sources, venture capitalists, angel investors, and all of that. So just to help us out with um, to, uh, to uh, funding round nomenclature, uh, you, because we hear it a lot. So you hear that... Um, a company has raised, you know, Paystack has raised their 200 million in Series B funding and all. So essentially, funding rounds are just structured according to what phase of the growth of the company they're coming. So pre-seed and seed stage will be funding that comes in when you are still at conception stage, you are still putting together a business plan and all that. Early stage will be typically when the company is still 
pipe new mid stage will be you know that series A. So if you hear series B or series C funding, it means the business has stabilized to the point that the mid stage of its growth. Then later stages would be maybe series D and onwards. Sometimes you hear as high as series K funding, even though it's not very usual, but it just helps you to know at what stage that funding is coming into the company. So sometimes also where the same investor puts in more cash, call it a series B1 or a series C1, for instance. So just to help us with some of that nomenclature. So the Nigerian startup bill is another interesting innovation uh, at the moment that we should be tracking. The bill has just um, been sent by the presidency to the National Assembly for passage. So we are uh, uh, eagerly aware that. So three major challenges that the bill is looking to tackle would be the lack of enabling environment for fintechs, unclear regulatory framework like CBN just waking up with secular to uh, ban trading in cryptocurrencies, and inadequate local content support. So this is the tech about analysis of the three major uh, challenges that the startup bill is set to tackle. So I believe with this one, the startup bill is passed to have a, a more robust um, fintech space in Nigeria. So thank you. That comes brings me to the end of my presentation. Sorry, I have a short time a little bit, and I'm interested, and I'll be waiting for your question. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Max. That was a very detailed presentation on the legal and regulatory landscape for um, crypto and um, blockchain itself. Um, thank you very much. And, um, you know, we want to really thank all our panelists, you know, for, for staying um, this, this long. I want to believe this has been a very, very insightful session for everyone. And we'll just take a, a few questions. Most of the questions have been answered in the Q&A tab, but, um, just the ones that haven't been answered. So um, the first question is, can you give some information about how coding works in smart contracts? Um, so any of our panelists can attend to this. Can you give some information on how coding works in smart contracts? Um, does anyone want to attend this? Okay, so that's one of the questions we have. Um, we also have another question. Apologies. Apologies. Is my screen still being shared? I'm trying to stop sharing, but I just can't seem to find oh. it. Please, please, if you could help me stop sharing. I apologize. Okay. Mm -hmm. I can answer the last question if you don't mind. Oh, that's okay. Please go ahead. All right. Um, okay, so basically, when it comes to coding and contracts, right? So smart contracts are written on a series of programming languages, right? But the most popular, which is the style, we use the term, is called solidity, right? So um, sincerely, smart contracts can be written in a couple of forms. These days, there are a lot of code solutions, which a contract could be layered upon, but uh, the coding is just uh, basically a way to, um, it's just basically a way, it's just basically a set of instructions to tell what is going to execute in the contract and what will happen at what point in the contract, right? So, but the most popular is solidity used in the Ethereum blockchain. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Um, I hope the attendee can, um, you know, listen to that and, and be sure that the question has been answered. And the second question is that, um, you know, what is the position um, of the law and, um, you know, what, are, what should be our considerations in terms of the immutability of the blockchain and the provisions of the NDPR or GDPR on you know, um, erasure and correction of data. Did we get that? Um, I think this one is um, maybe directed at Mr. Max, um, you know, since you're the lawyer. Uh, yeah. Okay, so, sorry, could you just take that again? Apologies, I didn't quite catch the question and I can't see it in okay. the question Q&A box. Yes, so the question is that what, what should be the consideration in terms of, um, you know, we have a um, blockchain and, um, you know, smart contracts proving the principle of immutability, right? Which means that the data cannot be deleted. Um, but how does that then synergize with the provisions of the GDPR and NDPR on, you know, correction and erasure of data? Okay, oh, yeah. thank you. That's actually a very important uh, question, the um, um, uh, data protection and privacy uh, angle to, to, uh, to uh, um, uh, blockchain technology. Yeah, so blockchain is immutable. 
But the idea is that while it's immutable, you can always add new information. So it doesn't stop you from adding new information. What just matters is, uh, or the what immutability is looking at is that you avoid situation where you are able to tamper with information and there's no trace. So for instance, if my name, assuming uh, maybe that's the information that uh, I'm interested in protecting, my name was wrongly spelled maybe in a blockchain transaction, I could possibly put an application and that name is corrected. But what matters is that the old record where my name was uh, wrongly spelled will still show up that it happened maybe at um, 11.02 uh, p.m. on the 1st of March. And it's been corrected on the 3rd of March. It will show that it's been corrected. So if anybody's looking up my name at that current time on the record, what they'll find is my correct name. But there's a record that shows when it was incorrect and when it was corrected. So immutability is looking at avoiding when people are able to tamper with records without any trace. Because that's what happens essentially if, you know, if uh, there's no immutability. People are able to change the record, and there's no evidence that record was uh, contrary before. So it, it doesn't necessarily that the fact that there's immutability does not necessarily contradict the principles of um, of the ability to change, uh, you know, to correct information based on GDPR and NDPR uh, regulation. All right, so thank you very much. That that answers it. Um, I want to say a very big thank you to all our panelists, uh, Mr. Adidayo, Mr. Matt. Um, Lady Victoria and Mr. Chia Goze, thank you so very much. I mean, this has been a very, very, very engaging session. And I've learned a lot. And I believe all our attendees have also learned, you know, so much. And, um, you know, I want to say a big thank you to all our sponsors, African Legal, um, African Law Practice, Farms Vial Solicitors, GLIS and Co, DOA Law, Advocate Law Practice, Everlaw Associates, and Bloomfield Law Practice for making today's webinar possible. Um, you can actually watch past webinars, including this one, on our YouTube page um, with the name My ESQ Legal. Um, our next webinar will be coming up on Tuesday by 1 p.m. Do well to, to join up. Um, um, thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.